We are live and recording. Just want to take a moment to thank everyone for being in attendance today. My name is Gabe Macaluso. I'm the Director of Customer Success here at OmniSend, and I am joined by three fantastic gentlemen. We'll call them titans of e-commerce industry. Well, at least two of them, and then Dylan will self-deprecate himself, I'm sure, but it's okay because he really <laughs> does know what he's talking about. Um, but yeah, let's just kind of go a quick round table. Dan, we'll start with you if you'd just like to introduce yourself and tell us what Dacity does. Yeah, so I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dacity. We are a data analytics platform for direct consumer brands, uh, really helping people leverage data across a whole bunch of different areas. And I'll just sort of throw in a, a, a tidbit um, that'll be interesting for this. So one of my prior jobs was actually running email for a brand, a company called Provide Commerce. Uh, and so one of the brands that we owned was Pro Flowers. So I apologize uh, if I spammed the crap out of you uh, for a number of years in the late 2000s and early 2010s, because we were sending about... Uh, uh, we're sending about 4 billion emails a year, uh, uh, and I had 10 people working for me doing email. So, so I uh, can tell, share a few stories as we're talking through this about, uh, yeah, what life was like back then when uh, Google released their promotions tab and we all freaked out. <laughs> That's perfect. That's a fun fact, Dan. Um, just out of curiosity, when you were sending that many emails, what was your worst open rate and your best open rate? Uh, we had, <laughs> so our best open rate was about 45%, um, with a, about a 30% conversion rate. And, and so I'll tell you, so, you know, when you, when you buy flowers for your wife for her birthday, one of the easiest things to do is to buy flowers again every year. And we had sort of that one click conversion uh, event. So you could buy the exact same thing, get it delivered to the exact same place uh, with the exact same message. Mm -hmm. And that performed, that was our best performing email ever. Um, our worst performing ones. Yeah. We did a, uh, we did some kind of interesting plays on red and blue post-election that totally tanked. Uh, so <laughs> it was not a good choice. That one had like a, uh, it wasn't so much the open rate, I think more the customer complaints that it generated uh, <laughs> based upon, you know, what we were trying to do. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, Dylan, we'll hand it off to you now. Give us a little bit of background. Um, cool. Thanks first, Gabe, for having me. This is awesome. I really, really appreciate it. Um, especially being with these guys, they're so sharp. So I, I appreciate being next to them. Um, my name is Dylan. I originally co-founded and led a CEO, an agency called now called BVA commerce. Um, so we worked with a lot of top Shopify plus merchants, um, Kylie cosmetics, movement watches, bowl and branch, Procter and Gamble, Red Bull, um, and you know, hundred, hundreds more, um, doing, um, billions of dollars in revenue through that time through Shopify Plus. Um, I sold that to a private equity group um, in 2018. And since then, I've been doing a bit of investing. I invested in dance company Dacity, um, which is phenomenal. I've invested in Gorgeous, Malomo, uh, Gives, and an influencer platform called Grin. Um, and I've also got an SMS marketing platform called Retention Rocket. Um, and then have a few small Shopify stores myself. So I try to really get in every angle of it, mainly because um, I'm somewhat of an autodidact and I like to really experience things and, and feel the pain of those problems so that I can really understand the needs of merchants. Um, and just really excited to be here. So thank you. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Dylan. It, you know, going back to your BBA days, obviously we've we worked together for many, many years. Yeah. What would you say is sort of the, maybe the smallest brand you started with and, and how much do you help them grow? And what do you think the key to that growth? Oh, wow. Is? So I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't, small is relative, right? But I would say sure. most substantial growth um, was probably movement watches. Um, and when we started working with them, they were doing around 200,000 a month. Um, in revenue and then um, got up to around uh, 75 million a year um, while we were working with them. So that was huge. Um, 
And um, not self-deprecating, but really, I think as an agency, I don't, we don't really take credit. Like we're there to help. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing I saw working with so many merchants is the more you work with, the more you realize you're, you're just there to support. Those guys are doing the interesting things that are driving their success. Um, and if, if they were relying on their agency partners to just drive their success, they probably wouldn't get as far as they did. Um, so I think we helped them clean up some things, but, um, but, you know, they really drove the success. And then, um, I think the other craziest growth was Kylie Cosmetics. Um, and I won't talk any numbers because they have the world's strictest NDA, but, um, <laughs> su suffice to say it was insane numbers and insane growth and, and a really great opportunity to look at commerce from a totally different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Um, and then how about you, Mike? Uh, yeah, so my name is Mike Rossi, co-founder, uh, CEO at uh, Smile.io. We power loyalty programs for about 70,000 uh, e-commerce brands around the world. We make it really easy to get and started with your own loyalty program in a few minutes. Um, our main goal is to create repeat purchases at, uh, at Shopify stores, at Wix stores, big commerce stores, um, and hopefully future platforms in the future. Um, we really focus on... Uh, getting that, that sort of first time shopper to a second time shopper or getting your, your shopper that would typically spend three times a year to five times a year. And we really focused on that. And that came out of our origins as an agency. So we were an agency that worked uh, with a lot of uh, brands that were on Magento at the time. Uh, so probably some flashbacks for some people here um, with, with the Magento world. Um, but we, we noticed uh, a couple dynamics where um, the brands we were working with were facing increased competition. They were getting less and less data over time um, out of uh, things like Google Analytics, and they wanted something that was just there for their customers that they thought would be good uh, for getting those customers back for repeat purchases. Um, we had really great product market fit early on with subscription companies, coffee companies, uh, fitness companies, and, and sort of it's grown across, across the spectrum there. But um, yeah, interested uh, in hearing what uh, everyone has to say about all these updates coming up for sure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike, I'm going to start with you with the first question. And this, I think this ties perfectly into what you guys do with loyalty, because from a customer success side, uh, we make sure that we kind of encourage loyalty as a, a next good step for a lot of companies who have the basic automations in. So this is an opportunity for you to plug away, Mike, because I think loyalty is so important. It, the first question we have is, what are some steps marketers should be taking right now in order to prepare for these iOS 15 updates? Um, and maybe quick background. So iOS 15 updates, timeline's been all over the place. I've seen some people say September 15th, they, they've heard a specific date. Other people are saying, no, that's just beta. Full rollout will be in October based on past rollout histories. And the big thing with this is Apple iOS 15 is going to make opens dead, right? So iOS, a big portion of people use it to open emails. And so can we really rely on that open metric? that's obviously gonna tie into engagement. So that was a little bit of a diatribe. But Mike, what should marketers be doing right now as they prepare for this rollout and change from Apple? Yeah, I, I think what we're going to see as part of this is a move away from micro metrics and micro segmentation for, for shoppers and more towards macro metrics. So things like LTV, average time between purchases and your ability to segment based on those and create campaigns based on those is gonna become really important. Um, you're no longer gonna be able to see I mean, in potentially, you're no longer going to be able to see what customers open your last email. So therefore, being able to send them the next. Oh. Able to use loyalty points as a proxy for uh, engagement are going to be able to segment based on those. But there's lots of different uh, indicators that we can use there. I think Dan might have some thoughts on that as well. I, I yeah. want to tee yeah, it up. Yeah, I was going to hand it off to Dan and, and obviously get into the stats, but also you kind of talked about avoiding this, this micro, but yeah, you did cut out a little bit, Mike, so I don't know if you can, <laughs> well, Dan will summarize. what I think that's the satellite say. internet we were talking about before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. So, um, so, so Dan, kind of tying into what Mike was saying with this, you know, moving away from micro segmentation to macro segmentation, looking at all of this data maybe kind of rely a little bit on your background from pro flowers, you know, sending to 4 billion emails a year, too many segments. That's a lot of work for people. So maybe you can kind of tie those two things together. Yeah. So, so, and, and first I'll just kind of share, there actually is another update, Gabe, that's really important, which is 
um, you know, it really is about Apple. It's about the, the mail app on the iPhone. And the other thing that they're actually doing is they're going to be masking IP addresses. So that means geolocation is, is not going to be something that you can do as part of campaigns. And so, you know, that was something that I've seen a lot where, oh, you want to see what the local weather is, or you want to do something about, you've got retail stores and you want to send something local about your retail stores. Um, that's going to be a challenge as well. And we'll kind of come to that. Yeah. So I think, you know, for me, you know, the, on the metric side, it's definitely going to be a challenge uh, because you're not going to be able to track a lot of those opens. And so it is going to think it is going to, it's going to basically kind of create, I, I, I do agree with Mike. It's going to kind of push you in two different ways. It's going to mean you're going to have to do a lot more segmentation to understand what, how you're performing as well as, um, a, a, as well as kind of thinking about things in a broader sense. So you're not going to be able to look at like your open rate overall is going to go down and your click to open rate is going to go up. Well, recognize like that's all complete BS, right? That that is not, that is actually not what's going on. So for all of you that were on the Facebook 30 day view or 30 day, you know, view one day, 30 day click one day view. And then Facebook takes that metric away and you're trying to compare your seven day to your 30 day and go, oh my God, you know, all my costs have increased, but it's two different like metrics. You have to, you can't look at it that way. So, you know, so I think about kind of first is recognizing that that's going to happen. How do I go get those benchmarks? How do I go sort of actually see sort of my benchmarks? Well, what we did, I'll go back to the Google promotions rollout, which was in 2012 or 2013. And if you're doing anything with email marketing at the time, you probably freaked out because suddenly Google was going to roll out this promotions and all your marketing emails were going to go into this promotions tab instead of the inbox. And we were all worried that open rates were going to plummet and click rates were going to plummet and our email performance. And, and at the time, email was about 30% of ProFlower's business. So imagine for a $700 million brand, 30% of that business came through email. That was a big deal for us if anything bad happened to email. And uh, so what we did is we actually segmented. We started tracking performance. We basically said, let's track performance for people on Gmail and not on Gmail and use the non Gmail to kind of understand if there was truly a macro trend that was outside of this promotions thing. And so I think that's going to be something that becomes really important. Now that begs a question, like, yeah. how do you know who's using iOS and the mail app on an iOS phone? Um, that's something that we're going to work on Audacity is kind of trying to build profiles around how do you identify those type of customers. I think there's a lot of kind of cool ways I'll get, and we can share a little bit about that later, but just some kind of cool stuff. Like that's how I sort of think about that kind of stuff in, in relation to Mike about, you know, you're going to have to think about mattress, macro segments, but then you're also going to have to do this like micro stuff to try and help you understand what's actually going on. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting. And, you know, when the promotion tab came out, there was all of that drag the email to the primary inbox. And you still see it every once in a while. And, you know, I still tell customers today, like, if you land in the promotion tab, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And, like, what we saw in trends were actually increase in engagement because people were then in the mind of shopping versus just deleting out the noise to focus on their personal stuff. So maybe this will just kind of cement what we've been telling people for years, you know, and, and Dylan, I'm going to hand this off to you. You know, we've already started encouraging clients, like maybe, maybe it's not such a bad thing to just say, Hey, click on this email. So I know you're interested, right? Like kind of going back to those days of add me to your address book, if you will. So Dylan, like, obviously we can't rely on open rates going forward. So when you've worked with your brands, whether it's a personal, personal brand that you're building or from your agency days, what other metrics would you recommend that our merchants look at outside of open rates? Well, I think the obvious one is like um, when you send an email or a text, does revenue go up? Like that's the biggest indicator, right? Um, but I also kind of take a little bit of a step to that, but a little step away is, so Dan's point, we've seen these types of things before, right? When we go backwards, I, since, you know, if I look back 2010, 2011, 
working on stuff within this. There's always the thing that's the hot thing. I remember back at that time it was SEO and then Penguin came out and everybody thought it was the end of the world, right? And then it's, you know, email gets hot for a while and then SMS gets hot for a while. And no matter what happens, um, ultimately what ends up happening is when something works really well, people tend to abuse it. And when they abuse it, there tends to be ramifications that impact the whole ecosystem. And so you can, one thing you can count on is these types of things really, really changing um, constantly. And where I'm going with that is I think that take a step back from looking at the nitty gritty and looking at, you know, the tactical and like, what's the next trick I can implement and what's the metric I can look at to try to, you know, edge out another result and another result and really look at, I think, the ultimate goal of all these channels and your brand really is to find people that believe what you believe. If, if you as a brand have a value system and you as a brand have a philosophy and a belief system, when you talk about long-term customers, it's about finding people who believe what that believe, believe what you believe and, and really buy into the long-term vision of your brand. And then stop thinking of your loyalty program, your email, your SMS, as marketing channels as every time I send, how can I edge up that money? But start thinking of it, how can I serve my customer, right? So if you really want to look at metrics that will define that, how does, how does repeat purchase rate happen over time? How does NPS improve as you start leveraging that, right? Like when I think of email, let's say post-purchase flows, I'm less interested in like getting them to come back and immediately buy, but more interested in how can I send emails that have content that helps that customer and helps them to be more excited about your product, helps them to be more satisfied with your product, preemptively goes against those objections. And I think every touch point that you have for your brand is about reflecting those values and serving the customer. And if your product is for real and your product really is bought into your belief system and those customers really have the same beliefs as you and you serve them, you're gonna win. Irrespective of the short-term bullshit that kind of, like everybody's so focused on, because if you're so focused on those little tactics, then you're going to lose in the long term, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And we've had a lot of conversations around how do we define our email audience? Because if you put that in that perspective, an audience is someone who pays to come see what you're doing. So they're invested right. versus if I have a list of 10,000 customer contacts and I've acquired this list over five years, but really only 2,000 people are buying from me, and what am I doing with those 8,000 people? Why am I stringing them along if they're not really interested? So I think this kind of cements the idea we have to really focus on engagement and focus on content that means something to these people. And service, yeah, and serving them. Again, I, I love that word and it because that's what you're doing. Stop thinking about what it's, what it's doing for your brand. And if you truly empathize with that customer and you really think about how can I leverage this channel to serve them better, I think it totally shifts your mindset and even the metrics that you focus on. Agreed 100%. And obviously the, the big driver here is we email people because we want to make revenue. We don't email people in hopes of a really high open rate. That's, that's, a, that's, right. that's a benefit, right? So Dylan, if you had to give the people on the call today sort of one recommendation, whether it's in how they send campaigns today or an automation they should have going right now. So like in the next 24 hours, if they don't already have it, they should go set this up. What would you recommend to those, those, those merchants on the call today? So in the context of increasing revenue, it would be an upsell or a cross-sell email um, for a really relevant second product that, that really will serve them and, and bring value to them. Um, in the context of you know, other things, maybe even an automation that says, hey, this is the CEO of your brand and uh, 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 I want to know how I can better serve you, right? That should be an automation. Maybe only a little bit of people will respond, but like if you're the CEO of a brand, you should be obsessed with serving that customer. And so I think that, again, every single automation, every single touch point should be about serving the customer. And so those are the things I would focus on. Excellent. And, and Mike, we'll go to you next. You've been, you've been quiet for a little while. What would you recommend to our audience, whether it's, again, segmenting to their campaign audience or setting up an automation or something that touches this email audience? What would you recommend? Yeah, I, I, just before that, I, I wanted to build on something Dylan said. Like, 
a lot of the times the the merchants who come to us and, and start with smile are actually in a pretty healthy mindset when it comes to this stuff like they're not looking to implement a loyalty program for overnight gains they're looking to implement a loyalty program to keep shoppers around for two three years maybe even longer if that's what they're thinking about um so i, I think that mindset is something we see much more often with with merchants who are in in that sort of mentality i think for for us, one thing that we've seen that's really, really interesting is the post-purchase sort of communication process um, around, hey, here's what you can expect from us over the next little little while. Like, hey, you just bought some nutritional supplement from us. Here's what you can expect from us. We'll send you this over time. And you're kind of giving yourself permission to do these things and set up sort of a cadence over time. We've seen that have a ton of success at even getting like that immediate sort of next order right away, as, as Dylan mentioned, if you put a cross sell or an upsell in that even, um, but also just giving yourself permission to, to do those future emails um, after that. Um, it, it, with a bit, a bit of a loyalty program bias, um, it, you can include some sort of personalized information about the points they just earned or the VIP like status they just achieved, all the better. Um, that's more personalized information that goes in there. Um, so if there's something that I'd recommend, it's, it's sort of that uh, post-purchase sort of setting the cadence or, or, or here's what you can expect from us. Here's, here's your points balance. Here's your VIP status. Um, just setting expectations really. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks, Mike. And, and Dan, I'll kind of hand this off to you. The same question. If, if you were in charge of the brand, what's something that someone has to do right now? Yeah, I, I think automated campaigns are really, really important. It's something that people don't do enough of, or they don't pay enough attention to them because you it's, they generate, you know, my experience has been they generate from a revenue percent just way higher. And so the key is just to figure out what are those uh, important triggers. And there's a whole bunch from having a really good, rich new customer flow. When you have a customer that's that just made their first purchase, how do you get them excited and in multiple emails in a stream to... Uh, what I like to think of is as, as kind of customer profile sort of changes. So I like to think about ones where, you know, you define what a high value customer, you do some analysis around what's a high value customer and somebody that that last week wasn't a high value customer and made another purchase and now is a high value customer, welcome them to the group. We did that with great success at a brand called Personal Creations that I used to work with where, you know, it was you bought for three different holidays. Like you bought for something to decorate for Easter, for um, Thanksgiving and, and then holiday. And we were like, welcome. You're one of our most important people. And you kind of, you, you made them feel special and that's what customers really want. And so it's things like that, or maybe it's somebody who used to be a high value customer and they kind of, you know, it's like, why'd you break up with me? You know, it's like, tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> it's, like, you know, it's, People love to give feedback as well. And so it's like, how do you do something that's a little bit different? And these are things that you can easily set up to be automations based upon data that you have that automatically trigger. And so it seems like you're sending something super personalized, but you're just using that data to kind of trigger that event. And it creates that really kind of cool experience. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, it's so funny because I get really geeky about this stuff and I'm like thinking of all these different ideas. So like, I think we've all seen the tweet where like there's the little counter on the bottom. It's like 45 people are looking at this right now. And then someone's looked at the source code and see they've just hard coded that in there. So there's an app somewhere that you can buy to actually track that. And other people are just, you know, making it an image to, to drive that urgency. Like, oh, 45 other people are looking at this. It's time to go. And I think that's what we have to remind ourselves as marketers and as brand owners. Like th there's no rule book that says you have to do this. You can, you can make up stuff anytime you want. Um, I worked with Mikasa and Falsecraft and those ladies on Long Island, like they definitely like they were still working on desktop computers when I talked to them in, in 2019, which just like blew my mind. But besides that, I told them all the time, I'm like, you can have International Punch Bowl Day. Like you can do a campaign on that. And they're like, well, that doesn't exist. I'm like, we'll make it like you can do that. So kind of thinking outside the box to create these unique events, these unique things to create engagement and excitement is extremely important. I want to pivot from here a little bit, just in terms of obviously we're focusing on email and, and open rates being dead. 
But there's these other channels we can kind of activate to encourage communication with our brand. And those metrics are going to be extremely important when we're looking at engaging a segment to send a campaign to. So we're going to be looking at things like last purchase behavior, last time they were on the site, last time they engaged with the brand. And of course, we'll still have email clicks. Um, so Mike, let's start with you You this round. What if, if you were running a, a marketing program and you're doing email, what channel would you look at to next to start implementing to engage with your customers? Um, I, I, I feel like if, if you haven't tried SMS at this point, um, you, you, you really need to get experimenting. Um, based on all the, all the data we've seen with, with SMS over the past, I would say two years, um, there's, there's been a ton of brands that have, that have had success there. That said, I don't think it's a good fit for, for all brands um, and, and all types of products. Um, but that would be the one I, I'd recommend checking out like right away um, if, if you haven't. Um, obviously, there's there's lots of other um, sort of marketplaces out there um, that that I'd also recommend checking out. There's lots of data available um, from them, but um, SMS has to be the clear winner for me. Excellent. All right. And Dylan, how about you? Um, I, I agree. SMS is great, obviously. Um, I've been fired up on it for a long time. Um, what I will say is there's a lot of changes coming to SMS in the near short term um, that are going to be making it more expensive and more challenging to get started. Um, so, you know, be prepared for that. I think anytime you have outsized results in a channel, which SMS drives sometimes 40, 50, 100x ROI, there's going to be other people with their eyes on that thinking, how can they get a slice of the pie, i.e. carriers, i.e competition, all those people. So I think we're going to see the efficacy of F SMS go down. However, it's just going to be more reasonable, right? It's still going to be a great channel, but more reasonable. I think another channel that's interesting, um, it, that's a little less saturated right now is postcards. And there's some interesting um, automated postcard platforms that based upon segments that uh, your consumer goes into will automate those and people are getting some pretty um, interesting results in that. But typically where I like to go next is, you know, A, things that are hyper proven or B, things where you can be maybe a little ahead of the curve and maybe the saturation um, is coming on down the line. No, great question or great, great comment. And I love the comment about the direct mail piece. Obviously, like credit cards, and we've probably all gotten the postcard from HelloFresh. And the only reason they're doing that is because it's working. So That's right. again, marketing is not following a rule book, but also not being afraid to, to copy others, right? Uh, imitation right. is the greatest form of flattery. And Dan, how about you? What channel would you, would you explore next? Yeah, I definitely agree with both Mike and Dylan. I think I'll say you know, prior to being in email, I was in direct mail and they said direct mail was dead and it kind of went away for 10 years. It mm -hmm. did kind of go away for 10 years. You know, people were stopping sending catalogs and stuff like that. Um, and the key about direct mail is really understanding is the analytic side, right? Really understanding who you're sending it to, looking at using codes to kind of do your uh, match back analysis, et cetera, to really understand, because it can be hugely valuable and it can create kind of, it can be a great add-on to things around email. I've seen some great campaigns where you send postcards and you sort of say, hey, did you see this? Or in your email, did you get our postcard? Where you do that kind of stuff. And absolutely the same with SMS. You know, I think it's a great new, um, it's a great new channel that is being really, that is super successful. Um, I think from my perspective, the key, one of the things to think about with SMS is like, think about them. Most people, you know, not there, there's very few platforms that allow you to do SMS and email together. OmniSend is obviously one of them and fantastic at that. Uh, you really do need to think about it as an integrated strategy and, and you need to kind of think about them all from an integrated strategy. If you do direct mail as well as think about how you're doing all of them instead of treating them as individual mm -hmm. channels. And finally, I'll just say, you know, we in at some point said in the late 2000s, we were like emails dead when social, <laughs> when social was becoming really popular. And everyone was like, that's the end of email. It's not going to work anymore. Well, we're still here. It's still an amazing retention channel. I think it's the cheapest retention channel out there. And so 
don't give up on it. No matter what happens with these changes, you know, don't give up on email. You're going to find it that it's, that it's still super incredibly important. Yeah, I, I agree with you hundred percent. And, you know, we, we can always tout the ROI on email and it's like, I remember sitting down with folks and talking about their marketing budget and seeing how many zeros they had on their Facebook ad spend, you know, last year. And it's like, okay, you're, you're like complaining to me about email. I'm like, come on, like, <laughs> let's, let's give me a little bit of that. Um, so that's a, a great point that you make there. And Dan, Dave, obviously- Dave, if you don't, oh, sorry. I thought you were doing yeah, sorry. Go I was yeah, just gonna, gonna add go, one other thing to what Dan said on the, on the direct mail. I think one of the other cool things is, I believe there's something powerful about a real world tangible interaction with a brand. And so I think that there's just something about it. when you see a billboard, et cetera, you may not be triggered to purchase right away, but it's one thing to look at something as just an internet brand and all your touch points are on the internet. And it's like a separate world for you. And it's another to start feeling and seeing that brand um, in, in the real world. And to Nick's question, there's a lot of them. One's called Post Pilot, um, but there's quite a few. If you go on the Shopify app store and just put in postcard or direct mail, you'll see trigger-based direct mail strategies and, and, yeah. and platforms. If I can uh, just add one more thing, Gabe, like one additional channel like related to Dylan's is there's probably no better time to, to sign really good short-term commercial leases too um, in, in the history of North America, <laughs> yeah. uh, like let's say in the last hundred years. So um, it, it's a cool time to be setting up pop-up shops and, and be collaborating with other brands um, in, your, in your neighborhood. Um, one thing we see here um, in in uh, in Ontario, where where we are, is a lot of local brands band together, and they actually chip in, uh, get a lease on a pop up shop. Do one brand's in there for a couple of days, then they swap out. Um, you can do a lot of creative things with with physical retail locations now, and sometimes that that sort of initial group of really loyal customers that you can build from that is the key to like getting going from yeah hobby type of business to a, a serious scaling e-commerce D2C brand because you have that loyal customer base that's never really going to shop anywhere else now that they've interacted with you. Um, so physical like retail locations, if you can, if you can get them sort of happening in a pop-up sort of uh, environment, it's probably the best time to do that. No, that's a, that's a great point. And you've hit on several things. I know Dylan back a little, a little bit ago, you were talking about post-purchase communication and how important that is. My wife loves when there's a handwritten card in the packaging even if it's just like, even if it's on the receipt or the packing slip where it's like, hey, Kendall, thanks so much for your purchase, Bob, right? And that was the mm -hmm. guy who packed the box. Like that means so much to her because someone took the extra 10 seconds to write this note. And we talked about that tangible piece, right? And people still get excited about mail, you know, being that COVID is kind of wrapping up, but for the longest times, we we're all like, looking out a window like, ooh, the mailman's here, like inter human interaction, <laughs> let's go check this out. Especially when it's a surprise. Guys, yeah, like when you when you're not seeing it all the time, you know what I mean. That's where I think um, it's so critical to not just follow what everybody's doing, and that's why all these like to dance point emails dead. This is dead. That's it's not dead. It's just that yeah. everybody and their brother and their mom, and that are the late adopters are doing it, and so you're lost in a sea of messages, right? But it's all cyclical. We see these things go up and down and up and down across channels. But the most important thing I think is surprise, like. Yeah. If everybody was sending a handwritten note, then no one would give a shit, right? But yeah. like not that many people are, so you can surprise and delight that customer and serve them in that way with to your to whoever it was earlier said feeling special. You know, I think it might have been Mike, but uh, or whoever. But I, yes, so yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, that's perfect. And then Mike, your point of having these local pop up shops like create a brand awareness. People, I think, during COVID, kind of took more time to research and be more responsible in their purchases and kind of take a look at what other alternatives are out there, right? We know this is a whole different topic, but we know that Amazon product search is the number one place people go to look for a new product. And now that we have a little bit more time, it's like, oh, let me go back to Google. What kind of local brands, what kind of local providers do I have that I can support during this trying time? And so now opening up those local pop-up shops where people can actually go and interact with the product, it's a huge, and I think that's really, really good advice. Um, Dan, the one question I had for you back on the data is, as we've kind of gone full circle here is, you know, iOS 15, our changes are going to happen. COVID is maybe coming to an end and people are starting to get back out in the world. What have you noticed in terms of overall metrics kind of at a macro level? Like, have you noticed 
what trends have you noticed from comparing this year to last year, which is challenging to do, and this is gonna be a blip on our radar in terms of how we compare year over year growth? Yeah, I think one of the big, uh, you know, certainly growth, year over year growth is slowing. And so people need to be really thoughtful around how am I measuring performance? So you had amazing year over year in kind of March because the world shut down in March, but then people started going online. And so now you're getting into comps that are really, really hard. So as you're thinking about strategies, you need to almost go back two years to understand performance as well. Like these customer groups that you acquired last year, you just have to understand sort of the behaviors are very, very different. And so make sure that you're, that you're making the right comparisons. We're also seeing a shift to, you know, everything went from, especially for retailers that were multi, that were omni-channel, that were, we're seeing sort of a shift back. So a shift back to retail. So e-commerce is still doing well, but their stores are, are starting to really open and their stores are starting to perform. And as Mike was saying, we're actually seeing a lot of brands use this opportunity for those that have the ability or had stores thinking. Oh, yeah, I think we lost your sound. Now, <laughs> uh, how about now? There, oh, there we go. <laughs> So I think a lot of, you know, so a lot of these brands going to retailers and, um, you know, a lot of brands kind of thinking about opening stores. And then the last piece is just, yeah, it's, we're seeing a shift away from Amazon. People kind of, you know, having been sort of more thoughtful around customers wanting to buy direct from the brands and sort of the amount that, that, the non Amazon. So people being a thought more thoughtful around sort of their Amazon strategy, especially because last year companies had problems getting product into Amazon from a fulfillment perspective. And so now really spending more time thinking about that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I know we have a couple questions from, from the audience and I definitely want to take the audience an opportunity. You've got three guys here. Obviously our focus is iOS 15 changes and, and not just focusing on open rates because opens are going to be dead in terms of tactical and manageable strategies around relying on open rate. So if you have any questions, uh, put them in the Q&A section. You'll see the bottom of your screen. A um, couple of questions that we've gotten so far. One I saw in you know, OmniSense specific. Does this mean if, you're, if you have an automation tied to, if they click the if they open the email, send it this way. If they didn't open the email, send it that way. Do I need to change it? Yeah, to make it 100% reliable, you're going to need to change it. But this is a great opportunity now between now and when it actually gets released to start playing around with some of those testing. So check to see like, how does click engagement work? How does purchase engagement work? And how do you change the copy of your email a little bit just to make sure that those automations are still running effectively? Uh, and then the other one real quick about OmniSense specifically was just talking about how is this going to impact revenue um, and tracking, right? So OmniSend, a lot of our competitors out there use last open attribution, right? So if they open the email, that's sort of a soft touch. And if they purchase within a certain time frame, that revenue is attributed to an email in OmniSend. So how, what does that look like? Obviously, if you're using Google Analytics and UTM parameters or other tracking like Dacity, you're not reliant on that open, you're reliant on that click-through traffic. But um, Dylan, maybe we can start with you on this. In terms of measuring the success of a brand based on a email marketing campaign, are you gonna look at just the bottom line revenue in terms of total orders for that day? Or how are you gonna measure the success of an email campaign and or automation? Um, if it were me, you know, I think number one, a lot of brands are different. And I think um, Dan can speak to the specific thing better me of this one area, but I suspect that if you look historically, you're going to have a typical life cycle for your brand and customer of, you know, when does that revenue start popping and how long does it trail? So it's not just like that day, right? You may have a brand that typically, you know, for three days following uh, an email, you're going to see, you know, incremental uh, revenue that, that's coming up and then slowly going down, right? So I think I think you can you can get a lot of interesting insights um, from your historical data that you do have, and then you can somewhat correlate that um, with what you have going forward. I also believe 
that I'm a big, are, have you guys familiar with like, uh, Cart Hook talks about this a lot, but the hub and spoke model of e-commerce wherein like your goal is not really to end up actually driving anybody to your main website, but rather send them through a journey of landing pages over time. Um, and so I really love that. Uh, and I, I coined my own term for it called a guided shopping experience, which is like, I don't want to just send people over and over to my website and then hope they go through and look through the merchandise and find something. So like, I think if you start to think of an architecture of a hub and spoke model, wherein you have an evergreen email campaign and series that based on a previous purchase, start sending them to separate series of landing pages, you can start to really get an idea from that based on who's going to what landing page at what time um, and their customer history of kind of like um, how those things are working. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely makes sense. And we're getting some additional questions here. So, um, you know, aspects of automations that are going to be affected by the new iOS update. Anything that's tied to an open, right? So if you're reliant solely on opens for driving your email strategy, whether that's on who you send campaigns to or who you send automations to based on the path they're following, all of that will be impacted. So you have the time now to start adjusting those things and really kind of thinking about Dylan's point here with the customer journey. Um, and then there was a question here, and, and Dan, I'd be curious to know, get your thoughts on this. And, and this probably be about the last question we have time for, but we'll make sure we collect the rest of the questions and get them answered. Um, Dan, what do you think about recommending a list cleaning uh, prior to iOS 15? Or how would you sort of create a segment of your main audience in your email list to kind of get rid of the noise, if you will? Yeah, so I think that segmentation is going to be really, really important because I don't think about, I don't think people should stop doing what they're doing. I think, you know, going back to what I said that we did at ProFlowers, which was basically created a list of Gmail people and we would send them a different sort of campaign than those people that were not. And so, you know, it's going to be, so with some platforms, you can go get some data around what was the, are they on an iPhone or not, right? So you can get some info about device type. You can, and 40% and of iPhone users use the Apple, the mail app on an iPhone. So that tells you that the, this segment is pretty big. It's probably 20 to 30% of your email users. So you're really going to want a segment. And so what does that mean? Well, you're not get, you may not be able to segment them all at day one, but you're going to get information over time. So if you get a click and you don't get an open, well, that's a pretty obvious indicator that they're on an iPhone, right? And using the mail app. So now what you want to do is you want to bucket them and you want to split it out because everybody talks about, well, A-B testing is out and geo-targeting is out. That's not completely true. It's only for those people on, it's only for that segment. So what you'll want to do in your email platform is basically try and figure out, and this is something that Dassey is, is, is working on right now, is how can we go and create those two different segments and now you split your population. So if you have a flow, if you have an automation, you want to go and say, do I think this person is, a, is an Apple mail user? Yes, do X. If they're not, leave it the way it was leave it exactly the way it was before, right? So all you're trying to do is take that probably 30% of customers and go and give them a slightly different experience. Perfect, perfect. All right, well, thank you guys so much. We'll give everyone one opportunity to have any parting words, just to remind everyone of where they're from. Dan, you're on the screen, so why don't you go ahead and, and sh share one last time who you are and what Dassey does. Uh, so I'm the CEO, co-founder of Dassey. We are a data analytics platform for direct consumer brands. And I'm just going to say, you know, my last parting word, we've been there before. The world is not ending. It's going to be okay. Perfect. All right, Dylan, you're next along my top row. So I'm just going to go to you next. All right. <laughs> uh, my parting words would just be focus on serving your customer and everything else is going to figure itself out. And if I could be helpful, find me on LinkedIn. Perfect. And Mike. Yeah, I'm um, Mike, uh, the CEO at Smile.io. Um, so we do loyalty programs for um, all sorts of e-commerce brands. And if there's one theme that you're hearing here, it's the world is going to get a little bit less deterministic over the, 
the next little bit. So be willing to try lots of new things. The world is going to change quite a bit as things open up. So be willing to experiment, try things really fast. And, and like Dylan alluded to, look at your baseline and see what your baseline increase is versus trying to get very deterministic about the exact campaign results. Um, that'd be my, my advice going forward for the next little bit. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mike. And my name is Gabe Macaluso. I'm the director of customer success here at OmniSend. We're an omni-channel e-commerce platform doing SMS, email, and web push notifications. Web push is a unique channel, and that's a whole other topic we can get into, but definitely try it. They can seem annoying, but they drive revenue. So <laughs> give them a shot. Um, and my, my parting words and my challenge to all of you listening today is create a segment based on purchase behavior, click behavior, opt-in data, and you can use opens for now because they're still they still count. And you might take a little bit of a gut punch and see your your email list drop, you know, fifty percent. But just send a campaign to that smaller segment and just see what happens. I, I'm willing to bet that you might see an op uh, increase in revenue. Um, obviously, less people are going to be opening and clicking because it's a smaller audience. But I bet you'll see an increase in revenue. So. Uh, definitely try that out. Just want to thank everyone for participating today. Thank you to all of our attendees as well. You will receive a recording of this. And if you post a question, we'll make sure we answer it in, the in a timely manner. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.